Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. On today's episode of Leader Up, we've got a great guest, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And this is someone from Army Management Staff College. Uh, I'm happy to introduce to you, Leader Up audience, Dr. David Calkin, and he is the Army Management Staff College Director of Innovation and Strategy. And so, Dr. David Calkin, thank you for being with us today on Leader Up. Thanks, David. I appreciate it, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for that. I I know our Leader Up audience is looking forward to hearing your thoughts about uh, Army civilian leader development and the civilian education system. And so uh, we're going to talk about this article that you wrote and was published uh, in May of 2022. And the title of that article is The Civilian Education System and Total Army Readiness. And so we're going to get into that article in a few minutes, but I just want to kind of give our audience a little bit of a profile of who you are, your background, uh, and kind of what your job is here at Army Management Staff College. So just your background as an Army civilian uh, and kind of what what kind of things are, are on your plate daily uh, at Army Management Staff College. Well, thanks, David. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here and to uh, to talk about uh, uh, some of my experiences and how that uh, interfaces with uh, Army civilian professional development. Uh, I first was uh, a re- I'm an Army retiree uh, and veteran. Uh, spent over 21 years uh, in the Army as an active uh, uh, service member, aviator, strategic planner serving in multiple command uh, and staff positions. In 2013, I retired and uh, became an Army civilian, first as a Title X at Army University, um, where I I worked as an instructor in distance education, as well as uh, the uh, Chief of Policy and Quality Assurance for Army U Faculty and Staff Development for about three and a half years. So uh, in 2020 or so, I came over to the um, Army Management Staff College, serving as the Director for Innovation and Strategy, which is really a, um, a fancy word for, uh, on a daily basis, an Army G357. And so I focus and my scope is on day-to-day operations of the college and internal and external staffing. So I guess you could break what I do on that daily basis in the three parts. Uh, the three uh, element is the operations where focusing on managing tasks and uh, making sure they're covered and completed uh, on time. The five portion, the G5 portion refers to plans. And so I try to take a, a little longer view focus and, and view on what the college is doing and uh, I say I spend about a quarter of my time on this uh, aspect of my job and my job description. So I'm focusing on faculty and staff development, budgets, resources, uh, also uh, long-term planning uh, and uh, higher guidance. Uh, so whether it's reviewing the TRADOC campaign plan or policy and regulations that affect civilian education. And then finally, G7 uh, training programs, where we're trying to really elevate uh, what we're trying to do at the college to ensure not only a uh, very uh, satisfying, but also a safe workplace. Uh, And so one of many examples is uh, developing an organizational climate program where we discuss some of those, uh, have those crucial conversations not just at the college level, but also at departments and the grassroots levels. So those are the those kind of wrapped up my uh, daily duties and responsibilities. And so let's let's look back in time. You've you've been around the army both as as a uh, commission officer and as an army civilian for quite a while. And just looking back on that time, how have you seen 
the role of Army civilians evolve in, in that time? Yeah, I think that's an important question because it's – and it's also subjective in the sense that it's uh, – I can tell you uh, that role has evolved in my own perspective of the role and responsibilities of Army civilians. But I've also seen it institutionally as well. So, for example, when I came in in 1991 uh, as a lieutenant, wasn't really focused on Army civilians. I was focused on surviving in my own career uh, in uniform. But the uh, civilians uh, then, as they do still, uh, provide that sense of continuity for the force at the institutional level. And uh, and that really corresponds with a, a kind of a robust dissemination of uh, about year 10 about uh, of the Army Civilian Corps creed, the use of the term Army Civilian Corps, and other professional monikers really to uh, enhance uh, n- not only the, uh, the existing skill set, but also reputation of Army civilians and what they bring to the table, because it's really important. So that's and that's a key component of Army readiness. At the institutional level, I think we've evolved over that time, the past 30 years or so, to really become more cognizant that uh, of the role that Army civilians participate in, in contributing to overall Army readiness. The problem is we're still figuring out what Army readiness means for Army civilians. Uh, so that that's one aspect, um, and also uh, since I've become on, I've come on the job, my perspective of the role of Army civilians has become more granular. So now I understand; I have a better understanding of the role, for example, of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for uh, Manpower and Reserve Affairs, uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Army for Civilian Personnel, and uh, also the uh, the uh, the federal. Uh, regulations and uh, policies that affect civilian education and in, uh, in the long term professional development. So a lot of these emerging uh, demands that the strategic imperative, I sometimes call it, really translates into uh, a growing sense that uh, civilians need to be and already are part of that uh, fabric of the Army uh, readiness and how do we bring them further along uh, to per- be full time participants and full participants in that uh, endeavor because it's really critical more now more than ever. I know a lot of uh, folks in uniform, military uh, officers and enlisted will say that their first uh, experience with a quote unquote army civilian was uh, that guy at CIF that wouldn't let them turn their canteen cover in because it had uh, threads, uh, you know, hanging out of it. And uh, civilians, uh, Army civilians are way much more than that now. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the How we interact with our workforce has an impact on our organizational climate. And, uh, and that's especially apparent in organizations uh, where uh, ma- many of us have had experiences with that with uh, mostly uniformed uh, organizations. But you can also see that in uh, mostly civilian organizations like the AMSC. And so uh, in, in that case, uh, you can see almost a, a, a parallel between how people feel they're treated and are uh, – contributing to the overall mission of uh, the service to job performance, uh, work performance and satisfaction. And, and so that plays a critical role uh, to how well we deliver um, our, our products, which in this case for Army Management Staff College is a, a world-class education and opportunity for professional development for our uh, civilians and supervisors uh, even some military supervisors of civilians who attend the college, and and so let's let's go and dig into this article that you wrote. And uh, I'll just uh, uh, remind our leader up audience: the title is "The Civilian Education System and Total Army Readiness." And so, 
what what was the motivation behind this article and what were you hoping to accomplish by writing this and having it published? I think it goes back to uh, part of what we were talking before about the importance of civilians in army readiness in the long term. That's the big picture. But on a more uh, uh, more tactical level, if you will, uh, if you just look at some of the numbers and the context, it tells you a lot. Uh, army civilians are about 23% of the Army workforce. And so uh, you're, you're talking about um, a 300, almost 300,000 people. That is a tremendous uh, impact uh, or that, that element or component of the workforce can have a tremendous impact on uh, how, the, uh, how the, the service performs and uh, how well uh, it can execute its mission. Uh, so the civilian education system is one of several components of that sense of army readiness that civilians uh, really have an opportunity to develop themselves as leaders as well as uh, uh, just professionals uh, in support of the service writ large. Also, the civilians, uh, our Army civilian professionals, uh, constitute a cohort of uh, the Army. And so, as, as such, uh, has, uh, there are rules, there are regulations, policies that apply. Uh, and such, uh, that part has yet to be, there is still room for development in that area. Uh, and so one of the, the, as, uh, the aspects that we saw in the last two years, uh, when we asked the question, how can we uh, ensure that Army civilian professionals are getting the opportunities they need to be the best they can be, particularly as supervisors of other Army civilians? And uh, where are some of the, uh, the key challenges that we find in the workforce? Uh, we kept coming back to one is uh, that the quality of our supervisors is is really non parallel. It's it's they're outstanding, uh, but, but of course we can always do better, and our supervisors and our employees deserve uh, to have uh, supervisors who have had the opportunity to professionally develop, and so uh, we found uh, just on a. Uh, uh, a survey of records that we could uh, assess, there are approximately about 19,000 supervisors who haven't attended their grade-specific civilian education system course. And uh, while that's required in uh, policies such as AR 351, Chapter 4, there's really no teeth uh, in the policy. Uh, there's no mechanism to ensure people are attending and getting that professional development that they need and require. So, uh, so we took a look and, and really found that since we are at that moment where we can uh, really make a change and a difference in this, we started uh, talking with our CAC leadership and Army U leadership to really address this problem because they quickly saw that it was directly linked to Army readiness. Now, uh, so, and it goes back to what we were talking before, that Army readiness, what does it mean for Army civilians? I think that's being addressed still. It's, it's, we're, we're still wrestling with that. But in the, in the meantime, uh, it, there's really no question that the, uh, if you have uh, opportunity for supervisors to professionally develop, you have better quality supervisors that leads to uh, a better uh, uh, a workforce that is better led and uh, more satisfied with the mission and their work performance. So those are the those are the key elements of why I wrote it because the senior leaders, uh, including uh, at Army uh, Management Staff College, but also Army U and CAC, were really uh, trying to get the word out that one we're here, AMSC is here, ready to serve. Two, we have a problem to help solve, which was that shortfall. And three, we need to get that word out uh, through the senior leaders as well as the grassroots levels 
to uh, really share uh, this this challenge with the workforce. And and the shortfall that you mentioned is the fact that su- Army civilian supervisors are, are not uh, attending their grade appropriate CES courses. That's where the the shortfall lay. Is that correct? Am I? Yes, that's correct. And uh, again, uh, part of the challenge is we have uh, li- a limited common operating pr- uh, picture of, of the Army civilian cohort, unlike the the uh, uh, the uniform cohorts uh, where you have a human resources command. That's a huge deal uh, because without that capability of a centralized management function, you don't know what uh, – what that uh, uh, that exact shortfall is at any given moment, uh, nor do you have the capacity to centrally manage uh, the uh, enrollments and quota managements, uh, quota uh, requirements for all of those courses, and uh, really link it to individual career paths uh, for uh, all of Army civilian professionals. So that that's a really important question that uh, I think still needs to be addressed. And that correct me if I'm wrong, that's kind of the role that this new organization ACMA is supposed to uh, start uh, helping with that that being the Army uh, Civilian Career Management Agency. That's part of what their uh their wheelhouse is supposed to turn into in the future. It's a big part of it. Uh, the reality, I think, for, at least from my foxhole, is that it's a, it's going to be a team effort, and it's uh, as normally it is in in the army. Uh, but they certainly have a tremendous role to play in uh, providing that functionality, that centralized functionality that uh, I was just mentioning, where you can have a civilian uh, in any location with any uh, career field being able to know and map out his or her career for the next 5, 10, 15 years and what schooling he or she needs to attend, what jobs he or she needs to uh, really uh, develop in, and also how he or she can develop uh, their subordinates and uh, the, their direct reports. So that that's a big part of it. Um, and, and so... Yes, uh, ACMA has a big role to play, but part of the situa- uh, this situation is that uh, there are other stakeholders in the fight too. For example, the uh, ASA MNRA uh, really has a key role in uh, civilian professional development uh, writ large over the Army. And so uh, stakeholders such as ACMA, DASA CP, as well as AMSC have a big are big components of that. DASA CP has a big role to play in interfacing with Congress in uh, discussing and addressing uh, the Office of Personnel Management requirements, over 230 of them that are mandated in National Defense Authorization Act and, and also National Defense Strategy, uh, and, and including a, a plethora of key topics such as supervisor development programs which uh, AMSC has a big role to play, but also ACMA. Uh, and they're developing, for example, uh, 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 human resource orientation courses for supervisors. So, uh, so it's a big, it's a team effort and it's ongoing. Uh, let's, let's go to this, um, this number that was part of a decision or recommendation that was made in uh, 2021. It's this 80% uh, civilian enroll or eighty percent civilian supervisor enrollment in CES courses. Uh, just talk about that decision. What went into that, uh, and and how AMSC is working to make that a reality. Sure. No, thanks for the question. It's a very important question, and really, uh, it it mounts to uh, a problem that we identified about uh, two to three years ago, and that was uh, goes back to that shortfall we were mentioning about supervisors are uh, to a uh, an extraordinarily large number not attending uh, their grade specific or grade appropriate, if you will, uh, civilian education system courses, um, most of which are managed through the Army Management Staff College. 
Now, there are other programs in uh, that you look at in Chapter 4 of AR 350-1 that uh, relate to civilian professional development that AMSC does not uh, manage. But for the most part, uh, AMSC uh, deals with uh, the foundation course, which is required for all civilians hired after 2006, but also the basic course, uh, and then also uh, the uh, intermediate and advanced courses as well as the civilian education, continuing education for senior leaders. And we're branching out the CECL uh, into uh, various domains to really address uh, the the development of the multi-domain operational environment. So with all of that said, we looked at what do we need to do to reduce this shortfall? If it's 19,000, if it's 20,000, Regardless of the number, we know it's there. Uh, And uh, that was really confirmed by not only uh, at AMSC, but also uh, the provost at Army University, as well as CAC uh, and TRADOC. And uh, and so we spent two years really addressing developing courses of action to to, uh, address this. One of the key components was to reduce impediments uh, to attendance. And so before, prior to about 2017, uh, the CES was 100% resident at Fort Leavenworth. And so there's a lot of implications for that. If I'm coming from Japan, for example, uh, is my supervisor willing to let me go uh, for a two-week or three-week course uh, when uh, they have a lot of projects on the the table and, uh, you know, I'm going to be gone from my family for a long time? Uh, it's a different uh, uh, calculus uh, than if I were the same uh, in, in the same position, but at Fort Leonard Wood, for example. So what we tried to do is develop a hybrid type of uh, approach for instructional modalities so that now, uh, especially by uh, uh, October of this last year, uh, we're providing uh, courses, CES courses in three modalities. So resident uh, here at Fort Leavenworth, but also uh, mobile education teams going out to satellite uh, campuses, as well as virtual. So that there's uh, this, not only this option, but also uh, a reduction in those impediments uh, that existed before. So it's more accessible. Uh, We're also working to reduce the length of some of our courses. Uh, Again, uh, that was a uh, major feedback that we received from the field. Finally, structurally, we had to develop uh, and really increase that throughput of supervisors to ensure that uh, they have that opportunity to, uh, to attend those courses that they needed to at their uh, specific points in their careers. So again, using those three modalities, uh, we briefed uh, through uh, TRADOC and then eventually to the civilian uh, Enterprise Steering Committee uh, on 18 November 2021, uh, to uh, which and they approved uh, the option to have 80 percent of students enrolled in our CES courses as supervisors uh, that of uh, Army civilians, with the remaining 20 percent being open for folks who are not yet supervisors but are aspiring to be them. And so that way it provides that opportunity for people seeking it uh, for uh, professional development. So that's how it emerged. And again, uh, like I said before, it's a team effort. Several stakeholders uh, where we at Army Management Staff College don't have the the scope or span of control to to really address those issues, uh, but uh, we really, our primary focus is on educating and, and teaching the courses. But at the same time, we're really uh, uh, closely linked in with uh, all those other stakeholders, including ACMA, ASA, MNRA, uh, and CAC to, to really make this happen. So that, that's what I would say is uh, that's how it came out uh, to be. And uh, I think it's an, it's an important step towards that Army readiness. And, and one other topic I'd like to talk to you about, and that is uh, a lesson that I do with military officers 
And these are uh, incoming battalion and brigade commanders. And uh, we talk to them uh, in terms of developing and engaging with their civilians. And many of them will express some level of frustration with, quote, unquote, how do I get my civilians to go do CES courses? How do I get them to develop as leaders? And so what what response do you have for that issue? What What are some maybe a mindset or just a way that uh, a military officer can help their civilians and help this uh, help with the shortfall that uh, Army Management Staff College or all across the Army Civilian Corps is, is experiencing with Army civilians? Very important question because uh, I think it goes back to perspectives. And uh, just to uh, go back in time as a military officer myself, and how I viewed Army civilians and their roles and their need for professional development. Uh, I would say I did not put a, 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 a primary marker or a, a tremendous value on that as compared to, for example, the War College or CGSC for, for the uniform cohort. That said, not only having become an Army civilian, but also seeing the changes in the operational environment uh, especially over the past 10 to 15 years. I see more of an, a, a role that Army civilians play and, and need to play uh, in the national defense. Um, so I would say, first of all, and, and, and I see this, uh, this perspective uh, still in um, even uh, Army civilian leaders, uh, the the ex- it, it, and it translates into the expectation that if you are hired as an army civilian, you meet those standards and qualifications for your job in accordance to the position description, and therefore there is no need for further professional development. I, I take issue with that because I would say that uh, just being a human being, you need uh, we're always learning, and uh, especially if we have a desire to, to learn more, that uh, supervisors uh, are obliged to, uh, to really provide that opportunity for people to especially seeking development. So I think two components to motivating those enrollments are one is senior leader engagement and also first line uh, supervisor follow through. Um, on the senior leader engagement, we're working this. Uh, in fact, it's it really comes down to uh, developing a, uh, a synchronized strategic communications plan, uh, which we have and are doing with uh, the Combined Arms Center and TRADOC, to get the word out that this service is there, that uh, Army Management Staff College is there ready and willing to provide that professional development opportunity. But perhaps more importantly is that motivation by senior leadership of the value that they place on that education. And in, in many reports I receive, it can be quite transformative. And that is so important when, the, uh, if you compare just the, the hours, the man hours that someone would spend uh, in a civilian career in education, if they attended all of their required courses, is a pittance to uh, compared to the military cohorts. And so it's, it's, it's an investment that, uh, uh, that pays off great dividends, in my mind. Uh, uh, as far as the first-line supervisor follow-through, I think this is critical. Uh, grassroots support, uh, being willing to let uh, f- folks go for a couple of weeks at a time to uh, get the professional development that uh, they deserve is, is quite critical, again, and it goes to that mindset. Um, are you of the mindset that uh, civilians don't really need that professional development and leader development? Or are you the mindset that uh, we all need uh, that uh, on a continual basis and the organization, when that person comes back, is much better for it? Uh, part of, uh, underpinning all of these things, I think, are, are, are structural um, uh, changes and reforms that uh, perhaps need to be addressed. Uh, I've already alluded to some of them. For example, the lack of a common operating pr- uh, picture, uh, uh, and that's due to a lack of central management that 
may be ultimately be filled uh, by uh, agencies such as ACMA and uh, Chara, but uh, more importantly, it, again, it's that team effort. There's also a lack of uh, alignment with policy, and that's still being debated. So, for example, I mentioned AR-351 re- mandates or, excuse me, requires uh, attendance at those grade appropriate courses, but there's little teeth so that if someone does not, uh, there are no repercussions. And so one of the discussion points is, okay, so what is a mechanism that can be in place to require perhaps uh, reporting accountability? Uh, so uh, one of the options considered to be AR 220-1, uh, US unit status reporting, but it could be also uh, in uh, uh, the char policies and so forth. So that, that remains to be seen how that's going to pail out. But having that mechanism, that reporting for accountability purposes is, is important, along with that common operating uh, picture. Um, also, we're c- currently reviewing and participating in rewriting the civilian implementation plan uh, in concert with ACMA uh, at AMSC. So, we, again, while we have a reduced role or, excuse me, scope uh, in this matter compared to ACMA, uh, which has an enterprise-level focus on the policies and um, uh, uh, regulations concerning civilian education. Uh, working together is important because that's how you're going to get the the problem solved at uh, uh, more holistically and for longer term. So those, those those are the key things. They translate into actions like you see in my article uh, where we're writing about the the services we provide and why. They're so important. And the fact that uh, – and letting people know that many of those impediments we discussed are uh, removed or in the process of being removed. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Calkin. And that's uh, very, very enlightening. And uh, I'm hoping that folks out in the Leader Up audience will uh, take heed of the things that you've said. And uh, I'd like to kind of finish up our conversation with some uh, kind of generic leadership topics and uh, so let, let's jump right into this and just talking about leadership books, what would you recommend uh, as your top three leadership books that you would recommend to folks uh, out in the Army Civilian Corps? Well, thank you for the question. Um, uh, I would say there are three books that have played a role in, in my role of prof- in, in prof- my professional development that I found very useful regardless of my position or rank. And one is um, uh, The Logic of Failure by Dietrich Dorner. Um, It's an older book, but it's uh, quite informative because he provides case studies of how we can learn from uh, when we fail and realizing that uh, those are sometimes the greatest learning moments for us. Uh, And again, it, it also underlines that message that we're all here and we're all learning every day. And th- and that drives links to that uh, motivation to professionally develop. Uh, the second book is My American Journey, uh, an autobiography of uh, Colin Powell. Um, great role model for me, uh, and I always admired his level-headedness. And uh, especially as he progressed in his career, uh, from uniform to uh, diplomatic service, what a what a great role model to play in in terms of being humble, uh, but also aggressive and having his voice heard. Uh, and so, uh, one of the things I learned from him was uh, he had uh, principles that, uh, and one of them was uh, you know uh, don't hold on to your uh, don't link your ego to your position because when your position falls, your ego will fall with it. And uh, that is a lot to say about uh, identity and uh, roles that we play and how, w- how we think of leadership um, in terms of organizations, but also personally. And then finally, uh, the Tao De Ching uh, by Lao Tzu. Uh, and um, he wrote uh, uh this book in about 604 BC or something like that. And um, I, I'm always drawn to poets because they can distill 
uh, some key lessons and also universal truths um, in, in just down to the minimal words, the essential words. And so one thing he wrote, and yes, I wrote this down, so I didn't memorize it, but uh, I think it summarizes leadership and uh, a servant-style type of leadership. So he wrote, uh, go to the people, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build with what they have. But the best of leaders, when the job is done, when the task is accomplished, the people will all say, we have done it ourselves. So, I, I, again, I think uh, those, uh, those are three references uh, that I, I found helpful over my, my experience that uh, I would recommend. That's a great quote. I love that. Um, I heard that from a basic course student probably 12 years ago. Uh, they, wrote, they put that in their leadership philosophy paper. Um, thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Um, and so how about uh, top three skills or competencies for Army leaders? What, what are the, the three things that, that would really help out uh, if I'm an Army leader that I would be able to do? All of these are, hard, are easy to say but very hard to do, and this is why another reason why we need professional development where we're always learning. I would say the top one is patient trust. Um, that supervisors and leaders are patient with themselves and with others and uh, make themselves trustworthy as well as their employees. The second is communication. Being able to communicate your intent, your vision uh, is critical and also having that door open so you can actively listen to your employees is critical. And then third is team building uh, that is, uh, I think, a normal result of that ability to communicate your vision. So from the first two elements, uh, you can do the third. And so those, those three, I think, combined help you develop teams, accomplish a mission, but also take care of your people. And so finally, uh, the last uh, top three for Dr. David Culkin is uh, lessons learned, leadership lessons learned. Uh, what how what would you respond to uh, for that question? I would say the, the 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 top three I would say would first be lead for your people, not yourself, and that goes to that Lao Tzu uh, essence of servant leadership. Uh, also, avoid linking your ego to your position, as mentioned before, uh, so that if your position falls, your ego doesn't go with it. So that's uh, Colin Powell shout out. And then uh, finally, actually, I, I learned this from uh, a classmate of mine and also uh, a fellow uh, instructor actually here at uh, the Army Management Staff College, uh, Eric Moore, and that is you can't fake caring. And uh, I always thought that was a, a very powerful uh, sentiment. So, Okay, well, thank you, Dr. David Culkin. Thank you for uh, helping our Leader Up audience understand a little bit more about uh, the importance of the CES program, how it relates to Army readiness, and kind of some things that we here at, at Army Management Staff College are going to do to remove the impediments for uh, not only uh, supervisors, but also other folks in the Army Civilian Corps to get their grade appropriate, grade required CES course completed. So thanks for being with us today. I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And so, Leader Up audience, what did you hear today that uh, is resonating with you today from this discussion we've had with Dr. David Culkin? Uh, have you done your CES course that you need to do? And what are the reasons that you have not done it? And are you willing to grow professionally and be, to, be a better uh, member of the Army Civilian Corps by signing up for your CES course? And please contact us here at Leader Up if you have questions or comments. And join us again for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.